Join the conversation. Contact the show on Twitter, on Facebook, and on our website, Motorsport Radio. Hello and welcome. This is Motorsport Radio. My name is Lester and we are talking Formula One. It's the Bahrain Grand Prix that we're focusing uh, mostly on the first race of 2021 and uh, well uh, to uh, to debate everything and we are going to have a mass debate this evening uh, we uh, please welcome um, Connor Jackson the motorsport.radio website editor good evening Connor hello Connor fantastic to have you with us uh, also to uh, Joshua Howells as well hello good evening hello Joshua Howells good evening thanks for having me and uh, Joshua Harrison as well. Another good Josh. E- yeah, good evening, everyone. Looking forward to the show as always. Fantastic. Well, it is our first show. Um, <laughs> just, just saying. Uh, although we did do a, a little rehearsal yesterday where it just basically uh, myself and Joshua Harrison yeah. uh, was just Went on forever uh, talking, waffling away about uh, the rights and wrongs of Formula One and uh, all the things very wrong with uh, various aspects of F1. And that's might be the uh the the thing that we descend into tonight you can get in touch with us uh, on the show and uh it's uh, at motorsport radio on facebook twitter and uh what's the other instagram. one as well instagram as well yeah we, we're all over just search for motorsport radio oh by the way as uh, as i found out today uh, we're actually on the first page of google if you ever google f1 radio Albeit, yes, at the very bottom, but still. Uh, we're there on the first page, just saying. Um, so anyway, yes, Formula One then. And it's the first race of 2021. And uh, yeah, it was, if you don't already know, if you haven't caught up with what's happened, uh, Lewis Hamilton won a, uh, a fantastic race, has to be said. Was not what you think it was. If you didn't actually watch the race, it was not anywhere near uh, a Mercedes walkover. It was an actual race, and uh, it was Max Verstappen who was narrowly behind in second place, having led part of the last uh, seg- section of the race and for uh, some of the race as well. There was a lot of close wheel dicing and battling, and uh, well, it looks like at this early stage in the season in 2021, Red Bull might just have the edge so far over. Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes. Bottas, as ever, in third place. Um, then in uh, in fourth place, um, Lando Norris. And, uh, well, a lot of people weren't paying attention to that, I don't think. Um, but he was there in fourth place. I had to double check when I saw it on my screen earlier. Uh, Sergio Perez started at the back uh, because he had some sort of issue. He turned his car off and on again and surged through the thing and ha, ah, surged and uh, ended up in fifth place overall. Um, Ferrari pair had a bit of a miserable race. We will get to those uh, later on. And um, yeah, if you wanted to uh, uh, highlight, we will be asking you who your winners and losers are from the race. And uh, biggest surprises, and uh, let's start off, I suppose, um, with the uh, with by asking uh, everybody on the panel, really, um, initial thoughts on the race. How much did you like, um, loathe, or was it a bit meh, the race? Uh, Joshua Howells. Oh uh, well, for me, obviously, I was really excited for us to be back watching Formula One. It feels like it's been forever since uh, the season started again, and. Um, I mean, like you said, it wasn't a race to disappoint. I think there were a few technical issues that plagued some of the cars, which means that it's going to be quite interesting towards the rest of the the season. I think as well, there's a big talking point around the uh, penalty for Verstappen on his overtake with Hamilton. And yeah, I just... I've kind of thrown away all of my ideologies that I had. You know, we did a show a couple of weeks ago looking forward to the season. A lot of my predictions have already come wrong, so... uh, it's it's going to be an exciting season. What do, what did you actually predict for the race? Well, for this race in particular, I thought first and foremost, I thought Ferrari were going to be back. I thought they were genuinely going to be, you know, top two, top three competitors. And uh, after that race, I was I was thoroughly left asking the question: Is the car? very good and the likes of signs isn't and he hasn't gotten to grips with the ferrari or is the ferrari just as bad as last year and we saw leclerc push it quite well for the first half of the race um 
I was very pleased to see as well that uh, McLaren are doing fairly well. I mean, I, you might remember I predicted that they were going to be one of the contenders for the top three. So I was very pleased to see Norris up in the uh, in that top four position. But again, as well, I I don't know. I don't know. There were so there were some big mix ups. I think you'll probably remember me talking very highly of um, Haas and uh, Schumacher, and obviously that one kind of blew up in my face as well this evening. Uh, not this evening, la- this weekend. So yeah, I, I I think we've got a very exciting season on our hands, but um, I, a lot needs to be spoken about about Hamilton and Verstappen. So the big takeaway for you is that you're basically rubbish at predicting things. Yes, don't listen to me. I think is the uh, moral of the story. Fair enough. Okay. Um, other Josh Joshua Harrison. Sorry, but I am going to. Um, this is going to get really confusing. We've got two Joshes on the show: Joshua Howells and Joshua Harrison. And I'm already getting confused. Um, so I don't blame anybody else listening. Um, but uh, Joshua Harrison, um, your initial thoughts on the uh, on the first race of 2021? Was it uh, well? What was it for you? Uh, fantastic, fun, bit interesting, boring, or what? Well, to be honest, I actually really loved it. I mean, like the first, obviously, first corner, you expect a lot of action going in, and then obviously Mazapan spins off, which is uh, shows you just how long his race lasted. I think it lasted two corners. And then you had the virtual safety car, which we'll get on to later on, which is about my views on all that. I'm not a fan. And then, obviously, the racing started, and it was... I found the mid-pack has extended. Whereas last season, you had quite a few teams in the mid but then you have quite a few teams at the bottom and the top this season I've noticed there's a lot more in the middle a lot more teams that could compete for points and compete for the podium if the top teams drop out and for me the biggest disappointment I would say is once again Ferrari Ferrari have had all this talk off in the off season they've got the best engine their engine so much better they're faster and it's just proved that that's not the case. Again, it, we're very early in the season, but I still think Ferrari are, if not the worst engine supplier in the race. Ooh, blimey. Well, I don't know who, who was saying that Ferrari has the best engine in, uh, mostly because I wasn't actually paying attention to any pre-season testing, to be <laughs> honest, because um, an old I season hand... you about this. Well, it's, uh, it, it, I mean, I've been around for, let's say, a couple of years, and uh, um, a lot of nonsense gets talked in pre-season testing. <laughs> about, uh, and, and, and a lot of it is just wasting my time, to be honest. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm beyond getting excited about listening to how every driver's excited for the new season, and uh, every team boss is uh, really going to be, you know, pushing for the front and yeah yeah just get on with it get it we'll we'll see at the end of the first race basically and now we have seen and ferrari's fastest uh car in the race was actually carlos Sainz, but it was only seventh quickest um just just thought i'd drop that one in there connor jackson um yes your initial thoughts on the uh, on the first race of the year was it a thriller it, it was a it was a thriller in um the downtown of Bahrain, I don't know. I was trying to come up with a cap, uh, with a fun line there, but I couldn't. But I do believe the race was it lived up to the expectation of um, the Hamilton Verstappen hype that was uh, that was at least um, propagandized to us before the season. Let's say that um, there was certainly a large push, I think, from Formula One to try and emphasise this whole. All oh, Red Bull have a chance this year; they might, you know, compete with Mercedes. And to an extent, I think we, I think we you know, got that. Um, there was certainly a lot of back and forth thing in the race between uh, whether it's either Verstappen or Hamilton had the advantage. Um, whether or the, uh, the either of them were leading obviously did change throughout, but Hamilton did maintain track position after the first pit stop, which I thought was quite crucial um, for his defence. And Verstappen was the one um, charge um, on the charge, on the attack in the later, in the sort of later laps. And it was that sort of... Um, and it was that sort of charge from Max that I think really put the pressure on him. And it was an in, it was interesting to see him really have it all to lose. Um, obviously, for the first time, um, I suppose, since the two of them started fighting, we've had a race where Max really was expected to come out on top. Um, and one where he's very disappointed to not get that result. Um, if anything, it does prove Hamilton's, you know, skill behind the wheel. It is, you know, he's not just... Um, 
uh, is not just a driver there driving the quickest car, but if anything, it does at least put a slight indication that Max does have the ability to f fight him in what is probably quite equal machinery. I know there's a lot of talk about Red Bull having the edge in terms of qualifying pace, although I think the long run pace, uh, both of the Mercedes and the Red Bull do appear on, do appear quite similar. So. I know there's a, probably a lot of people that will say that Max lost this race and it was, you know, it was his to lose. Um, but I, you know, I, th I think that I think it's more equal than people are making it out to be between the two cars. And to be honest, I think that makes it a whole lot more interesting because there's, you know, there's no point having uh, a team that massively, you know, outshines the other one. Um, just even if Verstappen was a, you know, an, inc an incredible driver in himself. To have two cars of equal machinery does allow for the better driver to create that edge, and we definitely saw that throughout the race. By the way, um, even if even ignoring Perez's um, uh, technical drama, where he had to effectively turn the car off and on again before the start line, um, ruining his whole race plan, and um, Bottas just could not keep up with Hamilton throughout um, throughout the main bulk of it, and even in the early laps, um, we saw. Uh, Verstappen and Hamilton build up a good 10 second gap to Bottas within the first 20 laps and that's you know that's 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 an incredible um, pull away and it reminds um, especially I suppose our older listeners um, of uh, the start of the 1994 season in which uh, in which Michael Schumacher and Senna basically dominated the whole field there was a particular case in the opening race in Brazil I, rem um, I remember reading uh, where by the end of the race um, towards the end of the race I should say uh, Schumacher and Senna had lapped the whole field um, and the two of them were miles ahead of the competition um, in even compared to their own teammates and so I really think we are sort of setting up for that sort of style battle of the sort of the old generation versus the new generation mm. um, and I hope this time we can sort of see it through the whole year interesting yeah you mentioned 1994 um i don't know why but you did um uh well why not because you know, <laughs> ev 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 everyone has to mention it at some point in their senna lives. yay um basically um so uh, very quickly then uh before we we do have a packed show this evening uh for you with lots of talk and debate and so such uh but uh, very quickly i just want to go through the uh through the panel and uh get your biggest surprises connor uh very quickly your biggest surprises maybe uh one or two word answer um who who surprised the most in the race uh alpine but they surprised me for not being good let's say that um <laughs> I was expecting a lot more from them, especially after the promises Renault were making the end of last year. Although I don't know, maybe perhaps I shouldn't be unsurprised considering the um, the, the massive upshift of um, uh, technical directors and drivers they've had over the winter. But uh, yeah, Alpine were a massive disappointment, and I think they're uh, they've really got to reassess their goals for the year. Connor Jackson still getting uh, sucked in by uh, lots of the uh, preseason uh, guff that's uh, mentioned by teams and stuff. Alonso, Co yay! Um, clearly, Joshua clearly. Howells, um, biggest surprises for you? Oh, uh, it's a twofold. Firstly, I was hugely surprised and very, very impressed with Sergio Perez's drive and his ability to get from the complete back of the grid all the way to fifth. And as well, it's got to be the power of the Red Bull because, um, like Connor was saying. I think we finally do have a, a, a car, a piece of machine that is actually able to compete with the Mercedes. And that is a surprise to me because I thought they would just uh, stomp it once again. Interesting. Okay. And uh, Joshua Harrison, biggest surprises in the race for you? For me, the biggest surprise I would say is Honda in general. The engine pl power train of Honda have come on leaps and bounds since last year. And again, I think this season we're going to have a massive fight, not just with Mercedes versus Red Bull, but I think Alpha Tauri will get up there with McLaren as well, so potentially a four-team battle in that sense. But on the other side of it, again, you've got to look at Ferrari. Why aren't Ferrari up there? How and how? And I want to see throughout the season how far Ferrari actually come from last year. Well, we will uh, probably um, big questions about Ferrari um, certainly. Because, uh, uh, well, is it a big surprise that they didn't live up to uh, pre-season expert? I don't think it is. Um, they've been doing it for a few years now. But anyway, um, we will move on. We have lots of different topics to talk about, uh, which include, but not limited to, um, should F1 race on every single continent? If not, why not? And uh, how much uh, development should we expect with Ferrari being so far back as they are, apparently? Um, 
yeah, we, we will talk about those things. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, focusing next on Sebastian Vettel. Contact the show on Twitter, on Facebook, and on our website, Motorsport Radio. And if you just joined us, thank you very much. New show with an old format. Talking about Formula One. Yay. Uh, this is Motorsport Radio. My name's Lester. Uh, we've got Joshua Harrison here on the show. Joshua Howells also joins us. And Connor Jackson as well for our first show. And if you'd like to get in touch and have your say, yeah, you can do so. Don't know why I said it like that. <laughs> but please get in touch with us. It's at Motorsport Radio, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and some such. And you can also download a copy of this show, put it in your pocket, take it with you wherever you go as well. Um, I believe it's called a podcast. You can do that as well. Uh, so, yes, um, moving on to our next topic, Sebastian Vettel. And this is a, a, a hot topic that Joshua Harrison um wanted to uh, slide into the show is he as good as he used to be i think we now know the answer to that but uh, it's probably worth debating maybe it was a one-off at the weekend if you don't know uh, sebastian vettel had a bit of a nightmare weekend and uh, he had a, a pretty nightmarish uh, race as well he uh, finished in 15th place a lap down in the Aston Martin behind uh, George Russell just saying um, do we actually know what the reason was for, for him doing that apart from yes yes well well the main reason good. we know the main reason go on what was the main reason so basically I don't know for those of you who didn't see the race um, he was he went on a very long first stretch uh, pit stop strategy. Oh yeah, where I think he went. They they forced Vettel to go on to to continue on tyres that were not the best, and he lost so much time that by the time he come out in the pit lane, he had to drive to make up the time. And then, but he already the wasn't the race, quick though, even in qualifying. Yeah, he 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 hasn't had the pace all all um all weekend. So potentially him going long. Maybe they were hoping for a safety car or something like that. It was one of those weird strategies that work once in a blue moon. And then there was the incident that led to him being a lap down and having the penalty at the end where, for some reason, he ran into the back of Ocon going into the first corner, despite the fact that Ocon went past him and then accused Ocon of moving over, even though anyone who could see saw that Vettel actually drove into the back of him it's, so you have to then ask why why was he why is he making all these what I would class as rookie mistakes well you say rookie mistakes it's also a similar sort of mistake that uh, drivers who are past their prime past their best um, also seem to make I remember Michael Schumacher in his final year at uh, Mercedes having some really stupid rookie style errors and smashing into people and dnfing and stuff um didn't happen very often but certainly the ones that he did do um were a bit stupid and i just can't help thinking that vettel is starting to show those types of things um josh howells um is is vettel now past his best well, I, I, we, we did discuss something like this on the uh, the preseason show as well. I, I think it's a difficult one because obviously it's only the first race of the season. Maybe he was a little bit off all weekend, but at the end of the day, he's a little bit older. Maybe it takes him some time to warm up and get back into it. Who knows? He could come out flying next race. I mean, he's not getting but out of what I think is <laughs> No, he's clearly not, is he? <laughs> I mean, what I think is really interesting is at the beginning of that race on Sunday, I... I, I couldn't believe how quick the uh, the Aston Martins were looking. I mean, I know there's been a lot of comparisons to them being, you know, basically green Mercedes, but there was just, there was something about them. They looked like they were able to keep up with the pace. And I said to myself, I was like, I think, I feel like they need a whole new 
racing lineup because the drivers just don't do the cars justice now i might be completely wrong but it does sound like there were some technical issues as well and and obviously there were a few strategic issues in play too considering vettel stayed out on his tires but to me it's one of those i feel like aston martin could really make a difference here but they they need to lose the back end of stroll so that they can completely rejuvenate their racing lineup and and actually you know what give the car some potential that's that's at least my opinion right now i know that that, that probably is quite controversial but i feel like you know aston martin could c- could do better than they're going to do this season just because i, f- I feel like you know their races might Th- let them down a little bit they literally wouldn't even be aston martin without the strolls well well you say that i appreciate he put the deal together but are you telling me that if you had an empty racing team with an opportunity and you went to aston martin went look do you want to sponsor us that they wouldn't still consider it you know i don't believe that they've gone into business because of stroll i think they've gone back into business because it's it's formula one it's huge for the brand they know they can compete but you would be right in saying they probably wouldn't have a car that fast if it wasn't for the money that stroll is throwing into the team so connor um this team effectively won yeah. this race last year with uh it was this race wasn't it with uh, yeah, yeah. Sergio well, Perez. The yeah. Um, it's the key but yeah yeah, and uh, a couple of months later, um, Vettel's managed to take, and I know they're not ex- identical cars, but it's not a massive evolution uh, and a massive step forward that the cars have had since this team won the race uh, here a few months ago at Bahrain. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, Vettel, he, uh, a- he does seem to be... I don't know. I mean, I'm reluctant to sort of suggest that he is past it, even though I have said that a couple of times now. But, uh, I mean, how competitive is he really, though? I mean, he's getting on a bit now. He's well into his, what, mid-30s, I think? Yeah, but so is Hamilton. Um, I, 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 will preface, I will preface this by saying, first off, Aston Martin don't need Vettel to be good. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll back that up by saying this. Vettel was not hired, necessarily, for Aston Martin to win races. And I... And that there's a point to that, which is you look at all their marketing. Their marketing is all based around um, Vettel's marketability, especially with their road car design. You look at the adverts they played between, you know, the Sky F1 broadcast. It was Vettel displaying the new DB5 or whatever. Vettel is there for advertising purposes in the same way that Schumacher was at Mercedes for advertising purposes, despite being trounced by Rosberg in the early 2010s. Vettel is not there to win world championships for them, nor is he there to win races for them. If he does, that is a bonus for them. And so is he? Is he an ornament? He he is <laughs> well. He's absolutely an ornament, but he's an ornament that um, that that can at least get something out of the car and bring the development of it forward. Whether they're right or wrong, I'm sure a lot of people probably say wrong. I think the team behind the scenes is pushing Stroll to be some sort of competitive driver and Vettel is there to develop the car in such a way to allow Lance um, an opportunity to at least develop himself into a frontish running driver Mm. now how long they keep Vettel on is how long they consider him to be marketable Um, I think part of the deal with Vettel signing him on was a case of right we'll we'll get you here to develop the car and we expect you to lead this team in the opening couple years and after a you know two-year contract whatever it is that he signed on for is finished they'll they'll review it and go oh where should we keep you on and fight for championship depending what position they are at that time but um i again it's will be a case of how vettel goes this is one race in the 23 race season um although admittedly if he has any races like this again, then I can understand, it, you know, it, it's not going to go down well. This, ha- this has to be an absolute low point for Vettel in the year, let's be honest. Um, but the other point is Aston Martin have really struggled with these uh, rule changes to the floor for the new season. Um, for those that haven't quite kept up, the part of the uh, part of the floor of the back of the car um, leading onto the rear wheels um, has been sliced away for the new for the new season. And this massively affected the Mercedes car, and it's one of the main reasons we have this uh, competitive edge at the front between the Red Bull and the Mercedes for this year. But what it's also done is affected the cars that have built themselves around the Mercedes, i.e. the racing point from last year, which is now the Aston Martin car. Um, Aston Martin, I think, have developed a fairly good car, but they, like Mercedes, have been utterly taken aback by these new 
um, aerodynamic changes, and as a result, they've suffered massively in the same way that Ferrari-powered teams suffered massively last season just by purely having a Ferrari engine um, and nothing to do with their own, you know, aerodynamic capabilities. And we're seeing this with uh, Ferrari-powered teams this year. Look at Alfa Romeo coming back into um, a midfield competition. Raikkonen and Giovinazzi were both running in points for you know, at least some of the race, and they finished 11th and 12th, so it suggests that points are very much on the board later in the year. Um, and that's within a, with an improved Ferrari engine. And we're looking at the opposite here. We're looking at the same thing again with the Ferraris last year as we are with the Mercedes-powered cars, uh, with the Mercedes chassis cars, I should say, uh, this year, such as the Aston Martin. This has to be a write-off year for them. The, aer the aerodynamic changes have completely written them off. Um, and even Vettel's you know, supposed best it won't be enough to save them. But he's been on a bit of a downward trajectory since that um, tragic, um, since that you know terrible crash in the German Grand Prix back in 2018, where he lost the lead of the drivers' championship. Um, and I don't think he's really recovered from that. Um, what mentally? Mentally, absolutely. Wow. Um, he never really um recovered his championship fight for the rest of 2018 it was all massively downhill from there losing it with whatever it was three races to go which considering he was leading the championship by the midpoint of the season to lose it with that many races to go was a bit was a bit shocking um obviously 2019 was completely out the window for them and 2020 was a complete disaster um and so we have seen Vettel on a bit of a backward slide as, as the others have said but um, even if he did get his act together and this was a brand new start and a brand new line of work for him that he could get his teeth into um, I don't think there's anything for him to get to get the teeth into because the car just simply isn't there this year. And as much as we could rag on Stroll for being, you know, Stroll, um, yeah. he's he's a fairly decent driver when you look at the other midfielders. I don't think he's any worse than, say, you know, Ocon or uh, Sonoda or something. Um, so it, 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 is a, it is a case of the Aston Martin will not be competing in the same way that the Alpine will not be competing this year, okay. uh, which does which does bring back to a second point about um, teams ranking in the midfield, but we'll get on to that later. Very nuanced point there, Connor Jackson. Um, Joshua Harrison. Um, you heard what Connor said. Um, maybe it's uh, a bit of uh, a, a multifaceted uh, issue, psychological, uh, uh, combined with the fact that the car just isn't very good. Um, but uh, really, question is, I mean, Vettel's been in Formula 1 for 14 years now, I think. Tw 2007 started off in, uh, I think, the Canadian in, Grand Prix. Sauber. Yes, yeah, in Sauber. Yeah, he started Sauber. from Sauber and then went to Toro Rosso and then that way. So, yeah. 14 years, I mean, he's won he's a, a good fair yeah. share of world championships. His first world championship being, what, 11 years ago, uh, or just over yeah. 10, 10 years ago, uh, in 2010. Yeah, I mean, just a bit like Fernando Alonso. He's had his time, and it, it, is it surprising if he was to, uh, let's say, step away and retire at the end of the year? Because, I mean, he could have been out of a, a drive this year, couldn't he? I mean, to be honest, I think after what season he had last year, I think he would have potentially contemplated retiring for this year, not coming back this year. And I think with the with Aston Martin and the sponsorship with them, and then with the um, technical regulations for next year, I think he has stayed on. Will this be a mistake? We'll wait and see to find out whether you know he will do a Schumacher in twenty thirteen where it just didn't have the season he wanted. Who knows? But it's. The same reason why Raikkonen has stayed on, the same reason why Alonso has come back. It's already for 2022. Those are not good reasons. new regulation changes. And, you know, I mean, this year, I think Racing Point, Lance Stroll, I think, is a good driver. He, is, he showed on Sunday he has the qualities or the raw qualities of a young and potentially race-winning driver. Does Vettel have still have those qualities? N not what I saw on Sunday. Oh. Well, he's... Uh, uh, according to uh, Connor Jackson, he's uh, he's down and out in the gutter. Uh, he has been washed up. Uh, and Joshua Howells and... Uh, yeah, Vettel uh, pretty much uh, in the bin. 
Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> you know, I think, as I said, it's this season, I don't think he'll be anywhere near the podium. You know, I think if he gets a top 10, well done. But bearing in mind, he's in potentially a race. Well, he was in a race winning car last year. And this year, it's he struggled so much he did on a Sunday. I don't think Racing Point have gone, or oh, Aston Martin it is now, has gone backwards. I just think he's not got it. I think whether it's his fitness, whether he hasn't kept up with his fitness or his mental fitness, who knows. But whatever reason, yeah, I think the Vettel fans out there keep hoping for another championship, I think. Okay, and final word on this to other Josh. Uh, Vettel is, um, as we saw uh, rather starkly in the pre-season uh, uh, Aston Martin launch photos, he's, um, his talent may be receding more than his hairline. <laughs> has, has there ever been a fast baldy in Formula One? I don't know. Um, but, uh, what a statement. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm genuinely trying to sit here and think of one, but I'm awful with driving. I can't names, think so. of one. I can't think of a driver who's bald. I can't think of one. I mean, when, once you have those visual, you know, cues to, uh, I mean, you know, you don't want to. Here's, you know, if if you're a new team launching with a, a new challenger, as they all are pre-season, um, you don't want to wheel out an old has-been Formula One champion who's bald, going grey, a bit past it, seen everything, a bit miserable now, <laughs> failed in his oh. past few seasons. And that's what Lester, Vettel... Go on. I want to stop you there. I want you to think long and hard, right? Does he not look as much as James Bond as Daniel Craig does? That, I was no, watching like, James Bond last really, night. Like, How do you know yeah, that? Like, no. I, like they, they. No, I mean, he, obviously, he, Daniel Craig's more buff, but they, they, you know, they, they've both got that same kind of look about them. You both, you know, dressed up in a tuxedo with a martini. I could give it to him. And on that note, Vettel. Go on. Yeah, I, I think Vettel looks like one of those drivers that you'll see turn up on a Sunday at an Aston Martin owners club meeting, who owns an Aston Martin, therefore thinks he's a racer. He doesn't. I think he, you know, he doesn't look anywhere near as fit and as muscly as the other drivers that's not obviously going to say much but he I don't know he with that bald with that balding look as well he looks a bit old exactly like I, look, I, I mean turning older, into bullying, older than Raikkonen yeah I think this is outrageous boys this I genuinely disgusting. think he could he could be James Bond let's just leave it on that alright <laughs> yeah, yeah and uh, that's, yeah, why, okay. that's why Aston Martin really hired him future project hey, can I can I ask a very quick question just because we're talking about this and Connor in particular you brought this up about um, Vettel yes. realistically only being there for like advertisement. Now yeah. I'm totally aware that that's why Schumacher and Mazepin have joined Haas okay. was for the sponsorship money and and all of the things that they could do then to invest in the car. Now why haven't they invested in the car and two why couldn't they get Vettel because surely he's a better suitor for Haas than he would be Aston Martin according to what Leicester is saying at the moment. <laughs> I never said that. <laughs> okay. Well, um, uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think Vessel brings as much money as Mazepin. But then again, I, actually, I don't know. That's a good point. Actually, I don't know how much I don't know how much World Championships give you in terms of um, uh, sponsorship accolades. Actually, listen, that's a fair point. Actually, I suppose maybe maybe Vessel does just bring so much sponsorship because of his you know accolades and whatever that he just you know he just funds the team effectively backhandedly by just racing for them. I don't um, think that's true. I think well, I, I mean, I he'll contribute, but not not in that not not to the extent where he's the one like funded. In it. terms of lost, oh, yeah, yeah, no, not compared to Stroll, not compared to Stroll, yeah. but you know, no, but that's a whole different thing. <laughs> it really yeah, winds okay, me up uh, that one. <laughs> in terms of lost leaders for that th team, um, surprisingly, Vettel is probably the biggest. Uh, yeah, deficit for. Th I don't think they're recouping their. They're not getting value for money. Put it that way. I I, I, I think, think we're all Vettel... being. I, sorry, I, I say I think we're being a bit over, over the top here with with Vettel. Like, I <laughs> I know he's had a I think I know he's had a bit of a sh a bit of a poor race. I'm not going to swear. A, a bit of a poor race, um, but just at least give him another five races because he had no testing time in that car. He had like a hundred. 
kilometers or whatever it was compared to everyone else's five five hundred or something. Um, like give him give him some time to at least adapt to the car, and then we can come back to this next show and be like, okay, he's good or you know he's okay fine he's actually passed it guys bye maybe you're, maybe you're right i don't know joshua harrison um maybe a final word uh final final word uh from you on this before we move on um but yeah thoughts uh final thoughts on vettel yeah um basically you've got to simply ask so does he need all that testing i mean he's been in formula one now for so long I mean, how much testing do you need to learn how to drive a Formula One car that you've been driving for fair. a number of seasons? <laughs> I mean, it is a different car, but yeah, fair, fair, fair. Have you watched Drive yeah. to Survive? No. Uh, no. Right, well, see, if you... If you... If you haven't seen it, this is one to watch. Definitely sit yourself down and watch it, but you'll get a better understanding of how different everything is each season. And I remember I watched an interview a couple of weeks ago where um, Charles Leclerc was talking about um, getting back in the Ferrari and having watched Sainz drive a Ferrari for the first time. And it's mental. He was he was saying that, you know, even though they were driving a 2009... Uh, sorry, a 2019 car, the only things he was basically getting from that experience is where the buttons are laid out. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, so that's enough, between, yeah. but in, in in two years, the only the only similarities in that car is like the steering wheel, <laughs> and I think I think to me at least that's mental because I've had the same laptop for about ten years, so I can't imagine getting in a car that's that different <laughs> over a two year period. <laughs> wow. Um, so uh, let us know your opinions if you're uh, if you're tuned in or you're uh, listening to this as a download. Uh, Vettel is the uh, are you are you a fan of Vettel? Are you still holding the uh, the candle for him? Um, hoping that he'll um, turn up to a race one day, maybe. Who knows? Um, I don't know. Um, maybe maybe we should all just take a, a bit of a chill pill, as Connor says, and just give him a bit more time. Um, but uh, not that much time, probably. Anyway, uh, this is Motorsport Radio, and we will continue on with um, another wildly different uh, subject, which didn't have anything to do with the race, next. Join the conversation. Contact the show on Twitter, on Facebook, and on our website, Motorsport Radio. Keen to get your thoughts on this uh, topic. And we do like to do things a little bit slightly differently. So we're not going to necessarily focus on uh, all the ins and outs of what happened in the Grand Prix and everything in Bahrain because, well, let's be honest, there are other podcasts and shows and things that will do all of that and they'll all sit around and go, yes, uh, so uh, tell us what you thought about uh, yes, Fernando Alonso. Oh, yes, I agree. He's fantastic. Uh, Jesus. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> yes. Um so yeah, we're, we're uh, instead going to talk next about Formula One and how right or wrong it is for them not to be racing on every single continent. Now this is a uh, a subject of contention by Josh Harrison, not myself. Uh, Josh Harrison's uh, wanted this one in the show, um, and basically Joshua Harrison, um, you were arguing that um, Formula One can't claim to be the pinnacle of world motorsport if it's not in every continent explain well because i mean basically cause you've got europe america you've got all those dubai races but why haven't you got south africa south africa got a big circuit kyle army she's a great circuit it holds a lot of intercontinental races but not formula one you then have WRC, which is in pretty has been to pretty much every continent. You then got the GT World Challenge, which has been to pretty much every continent. So why is Formula One, this huge company, this huge racing motorsport brand, not going to South Africa? Is it purely down to money? And if so, yes. should a race yeah. series <laughs> be run purely down to money? You know, so that's that, that's basically my thing. Can they call them a world pinnacle of motorsport if it's all about the money and therefore because of the money they're not going to a continent? Well, Lewis Hamilton has said as recently as uh, last year, I believe, middle of last year, that it's such an important place to go back, uh, referring to Africa uh, in particular, probably with the view of going to Kailami, uh, which... Uh, 
seems to be the only probable place um but also uh the formula one's global director of race promotion uh said that uh, this is chloe target adams apparently uh, uh the name That's says a cool it's middle name <laughs> okay um she says it's just wrong uh, that the world championship doesn't have a round in africa um <laughs> Well, I think, yeah. you know, sorry for jumping in on this, but you kind of said it yourself just saying it there. There's only one track that's really best suited for this opportunity. And obviously, Formula One is so big, they're going to follow the money. They can't help themselves. That's why it's been in Monaco every year forever. And I mean, that's why Formula One is so big now is because it's all about the money. It's all about the sponsorships. It's all about building the brands. And, you know, the cars that race in the Formula One are, are the, the, like the most famous brands in the world as a result and things like that. And I, I obviously there's a huge moral standpoint and they should be looking into looking into these sort of things because money shouldn't govern everything. But we're in a, a society where money does govern everything. We're watching a sport that wouldn't exist without money. Are they bad people for following the money and going to the racetracks that pay them the most? Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Communism. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no. I, I, I will say that I think they're fine for not going to Africa. Um, in in the same way that they're f in in the same way that you know many other sports from uh, cycling to rowing to sailing to you know. A lot of a lot of international athletics championships don't go to Africa. Um, they're they're still considered world world series, world titles, whatever. But um, you know, it's it's unusual, let's say, that a world um, series has to go to every continent. Um, more moreover, I, could, I mean, I could be really technical about this and go, well, if you want to do every continent, then you're going to have to make a race in Antarctica. <laughs> But no, I would pay um, for that. I swear, I, yeah, I would I love that. That would be the I best. Yeah, that ever. would be quite fun to watch. Let's do it right with that. <laughs> Jesus Christ, what have I done? <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I, I don't think they're missing out on anything by not necessarily going to Africa. Obviously, if Carl Army does, you know, stump up the money and it becomes a viable location to do so, then sure, certainly. Um, and you know, there's plenty of other um, African nations that I think. Um, a bit more stable for it nowadays. And um, Kyle Army, as much as it's a fine circuit, um, I think trying trying to get the funding in South Africa to do anything like that would be very difficult nowadays. Um, I, you might be m more worthwhile going to going to take the Formula E route and trying to do a race in Morocco. Um, that seems to be a more sort of stable place nowadays for racing, especially with the World Touring Car Championship and obviously now with Formula E. Um, so you know that, that that might be something viable to at least look into. Um, but I don't. I don't think you need to go on every continent just to fill this world quota. I mean, if even if we look at last season with the you know the, the COVID hit season, there was no race, no Formula One races at all in Pan America. Nothing in North or South. Um, and well, I mean, COVID but, aside, during a well, yeah, yeah. normal season. Yes, but you know, should we invalidate last year's World Championship because it only visited two continents? Didn't even go to Australia in the end because it cancelled. So you know, it was, it was only a well, ha ha. But you know, <laughs> they, they, they didn't they didn't hold races. They only held races in Asia and Europe. Does that invalidate last year's championship as a world championship? Or you know, um, I, I think it is just a case of as long as you're making an effort to go at least to as many corners as you logistically and feasibly, uh, feasibly can. And I don't, I don't think there's a, an aim or, you know, a necessity to visit Africa just for the sake of it. Well, um, I think it would be good, though, just because it's going gonna, it's gonna to raise awareness. It's going to hopefully inspire a new generation of, of African drivers to get into the sport, potentially. So, you know, there, I, there I, are I, definitely I, some... I know, but we tried that with... Perks to it. We, we tried that with Malaysia in the early 90s, and how many Malaysian F1 drivers have we had? Alex Young. Yeah, yeah, one, exactly. Alban. He was Thai. Oh, he was Thai, He's, sorry. Uh, That's fine, alright. I thought he was um, Malaysian, my bad. Oh. I, if I had a fail sound... sound uh, yeah, effects. I deserve it. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, Warren Schechter, the uh, South African GP 
CEO, of which I didn't even know there was one, um, said, quote, hopefully it won't be long before circumstances are such that we are able to reschedule an event and we look forward to working with Formula One uh, and the province uh, that I guess Kyle Army is in. Um, in our continued efforts to bring Formula One back to South Africa, Joshua Harrison. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, they said, it, especially with what went on over the last year and how Formula One, we race as one and we are all this equality power. Steady. To, to then <laughs> not, well, to then, you know, to not go to Africa. Is, is, it, is it sort of just like we're only going to these rich countries, to all these rich people, to what for them to do it, but they're not letting the Africa Africans to watch F1. They're, you know, Africans are having to pay all this money out to go to another country to fly to have a weekend away to watch Formula One or watch it on television. Is it mm. wrong that we that Formula One aren't taking it to Kyle Army or Marrakesh or something like that? So it is more accessible to the Africans, really? I, I think the argument of if you bring it, they will come has been proven wrong with these Middle Eastern countries and with certain other pay venues, let's say, where, you know, they bring these events to the countries and no one turns up, basically. So, if, you know, if, if there is a contingent in Africa that will go watch the Grand Prix, then absolutely. But, you know, just going to fill a quota, I, I, I don't think people will turn up. Hmm. Well, I've, I've but, been... I see, but I see I see your point, Josh. I see your point. I've been looking at uh, the South African Grand Prix wikipedia page and uh it threw me for a second did you know the first ever south african grand prix uh was held in uh um well not kyle army uh, would anyone like to have a guess at the other south african grand prix racing venue you won't get it is there another one <laughs> is it durban it's uh it, well it was a road course known as the prince Prince George Circuit, um, running through the coastal city of East London in oh, South Africa. Yes. Oh, <laughs> that's right, the popular <laughs> holiday so destination. Um, and uh, the, the race was moved um, to Kyle Army um, in 1967, but from 1934 to 1966, uh, it was uh, the official South African Grand Prix was held in East London. In South Africa. So there Very you go. Fun fact. Yeah. Just saying. Bit of quiz knowledge. Exactly. And you love your quizzes, don't you, uh, Joshua? I Harris. do. Yes, I yes. do. Probably get you to write a quiz or something about something. Um, but uh, Kyle Army, I don't know. It seems like possibly it seems like one of those types of circuits that might have maybe, I don't want to offend anyone, certainly anyone. You might write in or send a tweet because I can't be bothered reading it. Um, but I'd, it seems like one of those sorts of circuits where it's kind of had its day, really. Maybe maybe I am wrong on that. And maybe we might actually go back to um, Kyle Army and enjoy some amazing racing. And why not, indeed. Um, but it seems like fans in particular... Um, just like when the Nürburgring and, you know, the Nordschleife is always quoted as being like one of those tracks where you know we should go back to because it's great and it's the Norge life and it was great and uh, everything will be fantastic if we go back there well no not necessarily I, I, I think the I think the circuit's <laughs> a little I, th I think Kyle Army as a circuit is a little um, short nowadays it's 2.8 miles or whatever it is yeah it doesn't have like a 15 mile long straight uh, well, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> exactly no DRS oh the horror the horror of no DRS um However, saying that, if you know, if someone throttled the money together to put in a new circuit, I know there was um, talk uh, put in a runway. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I think there was talk many, many moons back about um, hosting uh, South uh, Cape Town, effectively hosting a street circuit around the old um, uh, the old uh, South Africa football stadium for the World Cup final they held, and they and they were going to make a whole um, street circuit section around um, 
um, around the uh, around the port, basically. Um, I know that was proposed a little a couple of years back, but that sort of fell through. Mm, interesting. Okay. Well, let us know your thoughts. Yeah. Uh, should Formula One go back to uh, Africa? Is it as important uh, for diversity reasons? Should they just be racing there, just to say for the sake that they should be racing there? Uh, Um, we uh, <laughs> moving at a breakneck fast pace onto our next topic, uh, which is uh, regarding development in Formula One. And over the past few years, whenever we've started a season, um, there's always been a, 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 a mass roll of eyes whenever the Mercedes have gone out in front and we all know that there isn't that much development that goes on mid-season in Formula One now uh, because it's not allowed. And, uh, and then we all just sort of essentially write the season off. But um, how much in-car, well, uh, how much car development can we actually expect over the year this year? Um, there is, uh, if, you, if you're not too up to date on F1 development and tech and stuff, um, there are development tokens, which sound a bit silly, um, which can be used for uh, what exactly, Josh Harrison? Well, as far as I'm, I understand it, the development tokens were given out two per team to develop either one big thing or two small things. So, like a big thing would be the back of the car. A small thing would be the exhaust system. And every team was given these tokens to develop the car to make it better. Uh, McLaren had to obviously bend the rules a little bit with a new engine, it had to have a new chassis, new gearbox, etc, etc. But obviously every other team has had these development tokens, most are focused on the front to bring back some of the downforce that have been lost with the adjusted floor. So you have those tokens and it therefore saves a dramatic amount of money on all these development of bringing a whole new car in for a new season and all these teams spending a lot of money in this COVID cash strapped year we live in. Interesting. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, Connor Jackson, um, will it, hmm. uh, will, will, will these development tokens then, that, that explanation from Josh Harrison was about right then, was it? Yeah, yeah, they were always used up at the start of the year, basically, and it does limit development throughout the year. Um, there will be um, uh, there will be an assessment, as it were, at the midway point of the season about how much um, aerodynamic development the team gets for the following year. And I was um, intrigued about this because wherever um, wherever a team sort of uh, is at the halfway point of the year determines how much aero development they can do towards. Uh, in the wind tunnel, this is, um, towards the end of the season. Um, so I, it sort of presents almost an opportunity for, uh, obviously up front with the Mercedes and Red Bull, but also all the way down the field, um, for a team to not perform that well in the first half of the season, get a load of aero development, and then suddenly do really well in the second half when they can, you know, put the time into it. Um, for this season, it seems a little bit non-plus considering the massive rule changes that are coming in in 2022. Um, suggesting that there might not be that much development throughout the year even with this um uh ha um, you know uh, halfway year um uh aerodynamic point mm. um 
but it, it it will it'll be very interesting to see how many people fight this um because i think well from what we've seen in the first race red bull if they have an opportunity to win the championship this year i i think they'd be quite foolish to um to pass it up um in the anticipation of it you know being better for them in 2022 especially considering the um honda are pulling out at the end of the year and they're going to effectively have the same engine for the next a couple of years. I know Red Bull are taking on the old uh, the engine development itself, and that's you know relieved a lot of problems. But um, effectively, the best the engine is going to be is this year for Red Bull. Um, so for them, I I think there's going to be a lot of push throughout the year to make sure that they keep this fight to Mercedes, um, and that might just give them the end uh, edge as we uh, as we approach the end of the year. Because you know for the last like three whatever it is like two three seasons, I'm sure Josh uh, Josh can. Um, correct me on this but Red Bull have been closer on raw pace at the end of the season than they've always been at the start so for them and Mercedes to be level level pegging come race one I, I, I think I think it uh, bodes quite well actually for the Honda camp that the title could be in line for them uh, if they keep if they keep it up towards the end of the year uh, but of course that's on a normal year and this is a Covid year um, where development is very limited anyway so it, I think it would be interesting to see if we don't have development um, at all with these cars, um, that the performance is locked in. And if the performance from Bahrain is anything to go by, that is an absolute disaster for teams like Alpine and Aston Martin, who, you know, uh, struggled quite a lot with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the new development and will probably be a bit of a godsend for teams like uh, McLaren and Ferrari, who are proving at least at the start to be the upper class of the midfield because I know last year we had quite a very tight midfield battle um, I don't know what the others think but um, by the look of it I think McLaren and Ferrari are sort of very close for that best of the rest slot and I can't really see any other team matching them on terms of pure race pace Well, that's an open question there Connor, well done um, Joshua Howells um, well, yeah. if, if, if we're talking in response to Connor, I do totally agree with him. I think I think that we will see a big fight between McLaren and Ferrari this year. I think it will be very interesting to see who really came out of this winter break better. Because at the end of the day, everyone was expecting Ferrari to hit the ground running and they haven't. And I was certainly expecting McLaren to be as fast as possible because, you know, they've got so much of the uh, Mercedes parts on the car now. So I think I do. I do sort of have to agree. I think they're the ones that are going to be competing between, uh, possibly for third place. Optimistically, um, obviously, I don't think there's going to be too many changes across the season. But we've already seen quite a few teams that have highlighted a need for some uh, changes to be made. Some, you know, hopefully some fixes to the car. I'm always curious to see how much goes on behind closed doors without us really knowing, and who manages to pick up. Um, those couple extra seconds after the first couple of races have gone by, um, I, I, like one for me as well. Like I do, I do really want to keep my eye on Haas because obviously they can't really do any worse than they have done in the last two seasons. Are they going to have any oh, opportunity can. to improve? Well, I'm sure, I'm sure they can, but you know what I mean. They can't really finish lower, and then, you, and then you start thinking, oh, you know, how much are they even allowed to do during the season? And then, even if they were able to do all of the changes, they were, is it going to make any difference whatsoever? I, I'm not entirely certain. And I think another thing that's worth thinking about is there's still this talk of an engine freeze going into 2022 because of the Honda, uh, because of Honda leaving Red Bull. And if that is the case, you can see there's quite a few teams out there that are probably not going to be happy with an engine freeze. I, I think um, that was I think that was taken away in the end. I think they agreed to let the development continue as long as they gave Red Bull some um, uh, some of their base, basically, which I think was agreed in a deal. See, this is okay, what well, I, that's good to hear. Then this is that's what fine. confuses people like me, and it doesn't take much, admittedly. But as 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 a now a casual fan of Formula One, um, having uh, demoted myself from um, full time fan, I just don't have the time. See. Um, all the intricacies of engine freezes, it seems like everything's been frozen for the past six years to the benefit of one team, mostly. Maybe this year's different, but yeah. And I don't actually think that the, the huge, heralded, big rule change and shake-up for next year, uh, Josh Harrison, um, will actually uh, do 
much of... Uh, I don't think it'll shake much up, to be honest, because um, I think we'll probably see the Mercedes, um, Red Bull and the usual two up at the front again. I mean, to be honest, I think the Bahrain Grand Prix was a lot worse for Mercedes than it looks on the front. I think Mercedes reviewing 2021 was a season where they could come to Bahrain with a car, dominate, win, not have to develop the car, save money, develop the car for 2022 and hit the ground running. But now Red Bull was so competitive, if not even faster than Mercedes, I think Mercedes will have to put some of the money back onto their car for this year to develop their car further to then take it to make it win the championship. Whereas I think teams like Haas have already said they're not developing their car this year. Haas have already said the car that they come to the champ Bahrain with will be the car they end with, which is really worrying for Mick Schumacher and Mazepan if the car is already not competitive. If all the others develop, that's going to be even a bigger gap. Whereas teams like Ferrari and McLaren, it depends on how far other teams go. I think it all. I think it's all this waiting game, where as soon as one team brings an update, I think others will follow to try and keep up. So it's who makes the first update, who makes that first push to make their car better, or will we just see that those cars in Bahrain stay the same throughout the year while everyone looks ahead to the massive regulation change in 2022. Mm. Well, um, I don't know. We, we, we have a tendency to uh, like to be a bit uh, defeatist with teams that are underperforming. I, uh, not naming any names, Ferrari, but um, <laughs> certainly um, the... I mean, you mentioned there, um, Josh Harrison, that uh, the Haas... Um, seem to be the traditional backmarkers. And I do think that we should have a um, an old-fashioned style traditional backmarker um, where yeah. one team is just the backmarker, and that's how it is. If you want to move up, you've got to spend some money. Um, but even Haas, I mean, looking at their qualifying times from Bahrain, um, they were st even the slowest person. I mean, this is how much Formula One has developed. And... Um, equalised in terms of performance and times and stuff over the past few years, the slowest driver, Nikita Mazepin, was still um, three, something like 3.5 seconds inside the 107% time. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and, and so apparently that's a, that's a massive gaff and a blunder for Haas, apparently, being within 3.5 seconds of the 107% rule. Oh, Whereas congratulations, previously, you know, congratulations, they didn't get disqualified. I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean that. That's. I'd like to see more competition in Formula One, where genuine teams are genuinely in danger of of not actually qualifying within that time. Really? Should I mean, the cars just explode? If that's they not really a, a no. I think no. Know, I don't think. Look, you, you're allowed a lot more competition without cars exploding. <laughs> there, there isn't an either all. I, look, I, I need all of my cars like to explode, or none of them. It's, it's <laughs> like saying just because no I want winners. more competition and more development and a lot more well teams allowed to at least have a crack at qualifying, uh, it doesn't mean to say that uh, you know I want cars exploding and stuff. And how would you feel if teams only had one rider, so you actually had twenty teams? Uh. Well, not right well, I don't think it would make much difference to be honest yeah I mean oh, you know. I think it would because you'd I, get I huge know. varying budgets imagine Mercedes only invested in one driver and then you have like and what privateer still Mercedes. trying to be a part of this oh well, yeah why not <laughs> I think I think it'd be really interesting I mean if we're going for reverse Money grid races further. and uh, you know uh, Saturday races why not uh, further mess about and uh, you know destroy all the teams <laughs> yeah, just rip it apart. It's it's just F1 it could be F1's um, equivalent of uh, <clears throat> experimentation. But enough about that. Um, so there you go. Um, basically, so the overall takeaway from that conversation there about development is that uh, there might be some development. There probably won't be any development, and this is how it is until next year, which will be mostly the same. 
All oh, right, I know. And ne- next year is <laughs> next year is go- next year is going to be radically different, Lester. I don't um, think it, so. It will still have like. <laughs> I mean, I'm not expect I'm not expecting Williams to win next to win next season. That's that's not what I'm getting at here. But there will be a massive change in how the cars are at least laid out, and there will be a few surprises. Obviously, I'm not saying Mercedes will be dire, but you know, if we can get anywhere close to a 2009 scenario where it's like uh, the Mercedes the Mercedes and the Ferrari, who were the two big teams at the time, are suddenly now down, and they're like third and fourth quickest or fourth and fifth quickest. That was a massive change for the sport as a whole that season um and that and that only dropped the top teams two three places um so you know you don't need mercedes to be Haas at the bottom of the grid you just need them to not dominate well let's anything see. that's going to bring us to that point is is a winner in my book sounds like there's an f1 car outside uh Josh's house Oh, I wish. Just a motorbike. Uh, <laughs> um, was doing any- MotoGP. <laughs> exactly. All right. Anyway, so uh, moving on then uh, from a development talk to Formula One um, to what's going to happen at the next race, which is in, um, what, about two, three weeks' time? When is it? Where is it? It's what? three weeks, I think, isn't it? Three weeks? That's what? a million years away. That's I, think, I think we would we'll, have all given up hope by then, waiting. Yeah. Um, 16th, 16th to 18th of April. Jeebus, that's my birthday weekend. Hello. Um, bad enough wait in between testing to, bar, to the Bahrain Grand Prix. Uh, the <laughs> Emilia Romana race. Yes. Do, do um, you want me to say the full name? Yeah, you you do it. The Formula One Pirelli Grand Prix Model Made in Italy e del Emilio Romana 2021. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah. All right. Beautiful. Calm down. Like art, Thanks. like art itself. I know. Yeah, Thank it you. sounded <laughs> Italian. Uh, but yeah, almost, <laughs> almost. So Imola then. Quite Swiss. Um, next Grand Prix in a couple of weeks' time, and um, well, predictions. Uh, let's start with uh, Joshua Harrison. Well, I think it will be a, again another one of those Grand Prix that. We don't really know because yeah, we raced last season and it was all right, but not much happened. I think Imola, it's it's a difficult gra- uh, race track to overtake on. You you think of where the big overtaking places are. You can only name really one or two, and so again, you have to ask. It will all be down to tactics, tires, conditions, and that sort of thing. So, so it would be hard to predict, really, but I would say it's got to be Hamilton win. I mean, he's a local lad for me. He's got to be Hamilton win. Local? <laughs> well, local-ish, in the same county. Oh, to you. Okay. Oh, I thought you meant he was, <laughs> yeah. that was his local circuit. I was thinking, no, wait, wait. What? Anyway. Um, okay, so Lewis Hamilton, you're saying for the win for the um, the Emilia Imola. Imola. Um, Emilia Romana, yeah. Yeah, um, Connor. Um, if uh, if if you had to have a bet, let's say you you put five pounds or a pound on the, on who would win, who would um, it be? I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna put my house. Uh, no, I'm gonna put my house on. Um, I'm I'm gonna put my <laughs> bet on um, Max Verstappen um, because um, Imola is a. Uh, as has been pointed out, it's a very twisty circuit. There isn't a lot of straights, and the Mercedes, their one strength um, in Bahrain was the fact that they could pull away on the straights compared to the Red Bull. The Red Bull has better low um, low cornering speed, and I think they can use that to get pole position. And assuming Perez doesn't have another engine problem, um, they should hopefully be able to use that to their advantage, and uh, we should be able to see Max take his first win of the year, I, I'm going to say relatively comfortably. Ooh. Interesting. Ooh. And uh, Joshua Howells, for you, um, let's say uh, you've got a, a bumper budget of £10 to uh, splurge on the winner of the Grand Prix. Oh, I'm splitting fivers. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I have to agree with both the boys here because I think it's either going to be Hamilton or Verstappen. But if you were to pick I one... Think- if I were to pick one, I'm going to say Verstappen solely because I think that he'll be able to get pole position for the start of the race. And and as the boys have said, it's very hard to overtake, so he might be able to just hold Hamilton off for the rest of the race. I think as well, the, the Red Bull's tactics seem to be a little bit 
but maybe a little bit better. They certainly were last year, so they could be hopefully this season as well. And uh, honestly, I think that's going to make all the difference. So we'll have to wait and see. But that's my guess. I'm going to. Uh, I did actually. By the way, I've not mentioned this all show, and I'm quite proud of this. But I won twenty five pounds having an actual bet. Uh, I did a, a couple of different types of bets though. Um, over the uh, <laughs> how much money did you spend to get that twenty five pounds? I basically just won my money back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, it was like an accumulator, for, and I was having a bet on Moto Two, Moto GP, and. Um, Formula One F1. as well. And I had a bet that there would be a safety car in Bahrain and Lewis Hamilton would win. And those two things happened, but uh, yeah, I didn't win the bike thing anyway. But uh, I'm going to have another bet <laughs> uh, w at the next Grand Prix. And I will bet that Max Verstappen will be the winner and there will be a safety car. Oh, that's three to, that's three to one, Harrison. That's three to one. Yeah. Oh. I mean, to be honest, if I had to bet, I would... I'd be very conscious. I'd be very risky here. I'd put a bet on for um, Mazapan to actually complete a lap. <laughs> <laughs> there was actually. I mean, I I had a bet with. Uh, I think it was Betfair. dot com, and yep. I there was actually a a um I don't, I don't know what it's called like a three way thing, whereby you could bet that Mazapin would be the first DNF. And there would be a safety car, and Lewis Hamilton would win. And I almost, almost put like ten pounds or twenty five pounds on that. <laughs> Other happening. betting sites are available. Yeah. Yes, obviously. Oh. Yeah, no, don't, don't forget. We don't um, condone betting either. Bet, it's bet just responsibly. A conversation. <laughs> don't forget to mention the bet responsibly. Do it, you course, Yeah, yeah. When the fun stops, stops, stop, stop, stop. stop. And also, don't listen to us because we clearly don't actually know what we're talking about. Except so me, because I want twenty-five saying. pounds. I, I, you know, <laughs> high, well, yeah. If you're up. if you're willing to spend twenty-five pounds to win twenty-five pounds, listen to Lester. Well, no, the, the potential. Listen, yeah. If if um, the guy who finished in second in Moto Two would have won, and uh, Fabio Quartararo would have won Moto GP, I oh, would. That's a lot. I would be right now. Uh, 200 and something pounds better off I'd be I probably wouldn't be doing this show to be honest yeah, be, is it, quit this show that's it I'm made now I'd be in like a quid. KFC coma celebrating something I'd tell you but then again you can say well if, if I won the lottery tomorrow I'd be going to Imola to watch the Formula 1 no <laughs> oh no I'd be I'd be sitting in Hamilton's car Mm, no. Oh, so not. no, no, no. Maybe that could be another topic for another day. What would you do if you won the Euro Millions lottery? And uh, what how much money do you think it would cost to sit in his seat? Well, depends um, which seat. More than I a mean, lottery, you, I, think. I mean, you could do it for free, but you probably get arrested afterwards. What I do is <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I like, genuinely like. <laughs> do you reckon you could? You could. Um, what what's the word? I've, I've, my brain's just buy your way out. in. Yeah, yeah. Do I you mean, reckon you could buy your way in? Do you reckon you could slide enough money to Mercedes and to Hamilton to have a race in the car? Right, to Mercedes and Hamilton, it's going to be incredibly difficult. But I'm sure you could do it for Mazepin. Yeah, exactly. Well, look at look at Mazepin himself. He must exactly look at Mazepin himself. And are probably begging people to have a go. Um, <laughs> well, I'm I'm sure you'll be uh, pleased to know that the uh, subjects of. Uh, uh, Mazepin uh, slash pay driver is he good enough didn't actually make tonight's show um, because I think we decided in the end that, uh, uh, he was good enough because that's why he's there <laughs> <laughs> so there you go I'm glad that's what we decided it's not what we said about Vettel but, uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, we like a diverse range of opinions on uh, on motorsport radio Hello, if you're listening. And, uh, yeah, please keep the comments coming in if you're uh, still tuned in and uh, or download this show. Um, and that's uh, really about it, really, to be honest. Um, our first um, show for talking about this in a long time. And um, we might talk more about it next week, or live as well, streamed live on motorsport.radio. Go and tell your family and friends. Gather round the internet. Um, but that's really it. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, Connor Jackson, um, thank you uh, for being part of the show this evening. No problem. It's been a pleasure as always, Lester. Thank you very much for having me. And of course, thank you very much to our other two presenters. Yes, who are Josh Howells. Thank you very much, Josh. No, again, thank you guys. I've had a really fun time tonight, so really appreciate it. Cheers. And Joshua Harrison. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you for thank you for listening. It's been absolute laugh, and I can't wait to do it again next week. And who knows, we may even uh, get on to doing some other stuff as well, uh, which may or may not be. <laughs> 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 Thank you very this much. This should have played when I said about um, Albans nationality. Oh, yes. <laughs> so racist. Thank you anyway, right. um, and uh, join us again for another live stream show on motorsport.radio and check out the website for the latest in opinions on Formula One, not just Formula One, but well, all of motorsport. Uh, my name's Lester. Thank you very much, and we'll uh, see you again soon. <laughs> <laughs>